how do you define what a public library is? And this is our most recent goal, and I just wanted to leave you with this one before we take questions. There's a place you can go to where you can consult the wisest people. You can listen to the dead speak. You can keep up to date with current trends. And you can learn to fix your dripping faucet. You can pop in for a minute or stay as long as you like. You can connect with everyone in your community without meeting them. You can ask questions about any topic in the world and get them answered. You can find people like you. You can browse, dream, relax, learn, chat, study, or just sit. No one will ever ask what you're doing there. It's open every day and easy to get to. And it's all free. And it's called the Public Library. Thank you very much and keep the Public Library going. We have got a bit of time for some questions, but I didn't stop in the middle. So if anybody has questions, please go ahead. Mm. How, do please. The, how do the displays work with metal shelving? They will work with metal shelving. It will slip a little bit more. On the, um, the big ones, you can get little sticky pads which will help to, firm, to, to hold it in place. But we do use these on metal shelving as well, but they will slip a little bit more than they do on wood. Yeah. Uh, no bookstores have metal shelving. It's another thing that drives people potty about libraries. Why have you ever got metal shelving? Scandinavia, they've got the best forests in the world and all their shelving's metal. There was, there was somebody who suddenly decided that books were old-fashioned and a wooden shelving was old-fashioned and we should all be modernist and have metal. And it's a mistake. No bookstore, in my experience, has metal shelving, doesn't make books look good. You can't adjust it the same way, you can't tilt it, you can't, you know, all those tricks that bookstores do, tilting it up to your eye, you can't, yeah, I don't go there, but they do work, but not quite as well. That's a fair, fair comment. Please, let me at the back. Is your presentation available online for PowerPoint It's not, no, but uh, if you want to take our online training course, you'll find <laughs> loads in there. <laughs> Please, any other questions? Please. How much would you uh, recommend uh, reading of uh, a collection that is really new? I mean, yep. <laughs> so what do you keep and what do you give up? Yes, that's a really difficult question, I think, and I'm sure everybody's got a view on it. I think books that are damaged are the first things that should go. If they look dirty, if they look torn, you know, that's got to go. The next one that's got to go is books that are out of date, when it's like um, you know, a travel guide from uh, you know, five years ago, go, absolutely. Um, if a, a novel is still in good condition and its cover design is quite fresh, you can sometimes find a new readership for that. You know, there's some great novels. We're very much of the now in commercial terms, and I don't think libraries have to, have to go with that always. Do, do you think... Do you think um public libraries need to have everything in the library, or...? No. <laughs> um, uh, especially the smaller ones. Uh, we, we have a lot of branch systems, like you do, where there'll be a big central library and then a lot of smaller branches. And uh, the one I showed you there, that we, uh, we, the smallest one, we took some radical decisions about the non-fiction there, because there was no way you could have a good enough collection of a particular subject for somebody to get out of their car and stop and see. If we tried to do it for all the subjects, you were going to have six books. It was ridiculous. So they took a decision as to which subjects they were going to stock, the more popular non-fiction ones, and that they would have some of the more academic non-fiction. They would be encouraging people to reserve it. They would tell people what was there. And they would occasionally have a special display. So for instance, uh, we didn't have many science books. They would have a special science display that came around at intervals. And I think you have to come up with ways of dealing with that, because otherwise you're just kidding yourselves. You've got one of everything, but actually you've got three old-fashioned books, you know, and that's not worth having. Um, uh, you know, it's got to be, the test is, you know, would you, would you use it? Do you think it's good enough? Um, and I think that's, that's really important. If it's not good enough for you, it's not good enough for your patrons. How do, how do you, how do you uh, get librarians that are 
focused on keeping everything in the <laughs> library to, to make that change? That is a very tough thing, and that's really where I started with library trainings. And it's a long process. Uh, but you can do it. You can do it. I think evidence is the best thing. But it was really interesting. I was late coming up here because I got into a classic with somebody on the stand downstairs in exactly that position. She had 300,000 stock. She couldn't fit a single book pod. Nowhere. Because, you know, she's just jam-packed full. And, you know, I, I, in the end, I asked her to experiment with one. You know, and to find a place that she could put it, to keep it full up, and to see whether it performed well enough to justify its space. Um, and you have to get people to try it and to monitor the evidence and then to actually follow that. I think some of those things about observation, where you watch people, really, really good. In the online training we do, um, uh, again in this more professional course, there's a whole section on how to take staff with you. On, you know, it, it's, a, it's a big question. <laughs> but I think you have to, and you've got to be brave as library managers. We have to stop the nicest staff in the world doing the wrong thing. And that's not easy. If they were all horrible, it'd be quite easy. But they're not. They're really nice. And you've got to stop them doing some of the things they've done for years. The custom and practice is ancient. I have to say the labelling is the other one. I haven't even got onto that. But you know, you're, you're not good at that. Do not obscure the book covers, which have had more money spent on them than you will ever have with a nasty little label that says the letter of the author because I'm too blind to read it. You know, I'm going to read the whole book. It's on the spine already. It's not needed. And as for those horrible little genre stickers, they are so patronizing. You know, um, I want to read really cutting edge crime. I do not want an ancient gun <laughs> like that on the cover. That's not what my Eurocrime book is about, you know. You do dumb down a lot, and that's the other thing I would really... It seems you've asked me to have a go, I'm having a go. <laughs> <laughs> but that does take time to do, yes. But it takes courage as well, I think that's what I'm saying. It takes courage. And just because something's always been done that way, doesn't mean it's right. And I think it's getting people to understand that in saying that, you're trying to take the best of the old-fashioned library with you. I don't want to destroy essence of library. I want to preserve essence of library. That's really important. But it has to kind of move with the times. I gotta tell you, I, 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 I do a lot of this, and I had two patrons in the stacks, and one of them came up to me and said, where are all the books? And the other patron said, oh, they're all right here. You can find everything now. And so, it, they, and then they got into a, like a philosophical debate, and. I just walked away and I said, let the patron take let care them of it. Yeah. 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 Whenever we refurbish a whole library, we do a staff training session, and they're always nervous about what people will say about the books. But I haven't actually ever had anybody say, where are all the books? Because actually, the books are more visible. We move them frontwards. What was visible before was desk and notices and all the things telling you what you can't do. <laughs> and now, it's actually books, more visible. So that's not actually, but it's always a fear of the staff. It's, yes. a, it's a small percentage from what I've seen. Yes. It's like one in a hundred or one in two. Yes. Days. The worst of your biggest libraries, because the traditions in biggest libraries, I'm just in the middle of doing one at the moment, are such that they are very different. The branch library is very community focused, and it's much easier to make changes if you can persuade people that that's what the community might want. In a central library, they'll run like the army. Um, and, you know, they used to be so busy that they need to be run like the army. I understand some of that. They have to still have that. But there is still a kind of mentality. And there was always some staff sergeant, usually female, 40, 50 years ago, that everybody remembers. And they all do it her way. And they feel shaky if they don't do it her way. You know, they're, they're going to go to hell if they, if they don't do what she said. And sometimes you've really got to kind of dig those things out and deal with them. Because again, she was probably a wonderful woman. But she wouldn't be right now, if you see what I mean. And it's how you manage to, to do that. But that, that's, very, that's very powerful, I think. In, in, and we have to somehow liberate people a little bit from some of those things. Giving staff more power to make displays, to make changes, uh, to talk to the patrons, all of that improves their job, no end, and makes them better at it. And I think that's part of what's happening in changing libraries at the moment. Um, but I think we have to change because if we only 
deal with the 25% who know what they want. The problem is most of those are getting older. Some of them are even dying off. <laughs> so, you know, the percentage is changing all the time. The generation we have now are used to retail product presentation. Retail products come out and meet you. They don't expect you to look for anything. They're pushing at you, take me, take me, take me, buy me. And we have a whole generation who've grown up with that. Now, I don't want to use those sales to make them take just the same as the main bookstore does. But I have to use some of that technique because it's very good and it works. <laughs> and I'm as lazy as the next person. If something looks attractive right next to me, I'll take it. Yeah. But why couldn't that be a writer that you've never heard of, that you're persuaded just to pick up? Some new writer, some experimental writer. You know, libraries could do lots for the culture in that way. I think that's, that's, that's where, because what stops people reading a book that they don't know is that nervousness It's not going to pay off for them. And all you need to do is to get over that first barrier and free them from the belief they have to finish it. And then if they get 20 pages in, they can give up because in the library it's free. You can go and get another one. <laughs> and there's millions more fish in the sea. <laughs> you know, so that's a, it's a great message you've got. You've nothing to sell except a good read. And I think we should be much more confident about selling that. We're not in it to make money, but we are in it to help people find great reading experiences. And that's what I would try and say to that member of staff, that this is a way to try and get there. But it is, it's a long process. And I would love somebody in the States to start taking our online training and get into this debate with the Australians. We've got two in Canada. And we've got somebody registered in the States, but he hasn't started yet. Oh, this is great. <laughs> because then we can have that kind of cross-cultural debate about it as well, which is interesting. Because there are some things which are, you know, at the heart of librarianship. And getting that discussed is really important, I think. Yeah. Thank you, it's a good question. <laughs> Any more questions? I should say that I'm here for the rest of the conference on the Brodart booth, which is, somebody tell me the number? 25, 32, thank you very much. And we have the table units of the book pods and everything down there. Um, so for me, it's been really good to be able to bring these to the States because we just couldn't see how we could do it. So making a partnership with another company to do that's worked well. Please, one more question. Uh, so you're a physical space uh, lover and a uh, physical book lover. Yes. So how are you dealing with your philosophical argument versus digital uh, books? Oh, I didn't see any, any problem with that. Um, it's the reading experience I'm interested in. So if, if it's available digitally, let's try and get the best we can there. The problem I have is that libraries, and certainly in the UK, aren't being given the access to offer that digital experience because of the commercial constraints over the fear that if people can get it through the library, they won't buy it. So we're locked out of that. And I think that's a terrible shame, and I wish the politicians would do something about that. But no, I'm a Kindle reader as well. I, think, I don't think print books are going to die, but I think digital books, certainly for reference, they're loads better. So I don't have a problem with that at all. I think you then have the interesting presentation of digital things. You know, you've got just the same problems with choice digitally as you have physically. In fact, just, just as difficult, really. If you want something that joins things up, have a look at which book, because that actually is something which could only happen on the internet because it's driven by an algorithm and it's got a lot of human readers who read for it. And uh, you couldn't do it as a single library. Um, but it's actually promoting both print books and e-books, but the e-books are often only available commercially. Um, but again, I don't think the library, as an institution, has a problem with digital. Um, it's just whether you're going to be allowed to, to have any of it. <laughs> so do you think that there's going to be a, uh, a, a pro-democratic -de uh, wave be uh, on the print side versus the digital side, since it's so hard to get those digital titles? That's very interesting, isn't it? That's a difficult one to predict, I think. I mean, I think there are some reading experiences which will stay in print, um, and some people will always want those in print. One of the things that we saw happen before the big wave of e-books, uh, which I didn't talk about as an example, but the most successful promotion we ever did in the UK, and I've come out of a fiction background much more, was a non-fiction promotion. And it was of what in the UK we call in the book trade narrative non-fiction. Um, so it's not textbooks, it's not study books, it's books that are packaged like novels. Um, one of the first, most famously, was Cod, Mark Polanski, American again. 
and you know, it's it's crossing Dewey categories. It's history, it's science, it's it's business, it's a whole lot of different things. And we made a whole collection of those books because libraries weren't buying them enough. And it was partly because they didn't know what to do with them. And it was the most popular thing we'd ever done. Now I think the publishers started to create those because they'd lost the reference book market. And they knew that they, they you know, because anything that's more informational is going to be better online. It can be updated quicker, it's more accurate, it's more economical. But that narrative experience of reading a whole chapter at a time with no footnotes, that was where they took non-fiction. So it is quite interesting, you know, will we have a new kind of reading in print as well? Um, but I think people's habits change also. The more you read on a Kindle, um, you know, the more familiarised you get with it. So there's going to be another generation, I think. But of course, library books aren't available on Kindles. Go back with the commercial situation again. So uh, I think there's a lot of interesting things that could happen. I just hope that libraries as the conduit, libraries as the interpreter, as the navigator, as the, that's the role to hold on to. Don't, don't uh, you know, say it must be print. It doesn't matter what the format is. It's the, it's the experience that you're enabling people to access. That's what's important, I think. Thank you. Any last questions? Well, thank you all very much for listening.